Welcome to a new lecture series called The New World Order. My name is Alexander Stubb. I'm professor and director here at the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute in Florence. This lecture series is basically about a book that I'm working on right now. The working title of the book is The Global West versus the Global East hyphen or how the Global South is going to decide the new world disorder. And what I want to do in this series is basically to paint a picture of what this book is about. We're talking quite a long lecture series, about 15 to 20 minutes on each lecture because I will go through the content of the book and the argument of the book. And of course, my aim is for this to be an interactive series in the sense that I would really appreciate uh, your feedback uh, as we go along. Now, in this first lecture, I will just give you the contours uh, or the table of content and the basic idea uh, of the book before I then start the actual lecture series with an introduction, with the nine chapters um, and with a conclusion. But just to give you an idea, uh, the basic thought about writing a book, um, it is my 20th book, uh, came uh, about 2020. And the idea was that I was going to write something about global politics and tech. I actually went as far as to write a 60-page outline um, of a book which was called uh, Digital Democracy or Digital Dictatorship. But of course, then came COVID, uh, then came the war in Ukraine, uh, and I think pretty much a shake-up of the whole uh, world order, and I had to go back to the drawing board. Now, uh, I'll begin today by just giving you the table of content and some ideas from the preface so that you get a sense of what this book about the New World Disorder uh, is all about. So the table of content, I go you know, with my traditional three points, I guess. So I begin with a preface, then there is an introduction, and then the book has three parts and each part has three chapters. The first part is the order of power. The second part is the balance of power. And the third part is the dynamics of power. So under the first part, order of power, I have three chapters. Chapter one is called from order to disorder. So that basically describes the transition from the bipolar Cold War to the unipolar moment of the early uh, Cold War, a post-Cold War uh, era. Then chapter two is called From Disorder to Disruption. So this is basically the slow slide uh, starting with 9-11 and then culminating uh, in, uh, in February 2024 when Russia attacks uh, Ukraine. And it shows how we went from the bi bipolar world of the Cold War, the unipolar world of the early uh, post-Cold War, to a multipolar world, basically, of uh, disorder, which was disrupted by the attack of Russia on Ukraine. The third chapter is called From Disruption to Indigestion. And in this one, I pretty much go through the history of multilateral institutions. You won't believe how many there are and how they have developed actually all the way since uh, World War II. So this is basically this first part of the book, the first three chapters is looking at the order of power, how it has oscillated uh, between the West and the East uh, and the South. The second part of the book is called the balance of power. 
And the balance of power also has three chapters, chapters 4, 5 and 6. The first one is about the global West. In other words, the European Union, the United States, uh, other European countries and allies such as Japan, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea. Roughly speaking, a quarter of the world's countries who essentially believe in a system of governments which is based on liberal democracy, social market economy and globalization. They are the rule setters pretty much of the post-World War II uh, era. On the other side, chapter 5 is about the Global East. And the Global East I defined as China, Russia and a number of countries that more or less uh, support uh, these two uh, big players. They of course want to disrupt the current world order. They don't believe in the liberal world order. Uh, they want to change the norms on the basis of which the order uh, has been set. And the third uh, chapter in this uh, second part is chapter six called the Global South. And the Global South I define very broadly uh, as basically most of Asia led by India, the Middle East led by, and the Gulf region led by Saudi Arabia, uh, Africa led by South Africa and Nigeria, or Latin America uh, led by Brazil. I'll of course explain why I use this categorization, but here we're talking about, you know, 120, 125 uh, countries. The big thesis of the book, which I'll come back to uh, in the introduction, is to say that there is a power struggle ongoing between the global West and the global East. And my argument is that it is the global South that's going to decide uh, the direction in which the pendulum will swing in this world uh, of uh, disorder. Uh, finally, the third part of the book uh, is chapters 7, 8 and 9. The first one is about competition. The second one is about conflict. And the third one is about cooperation. And these chap in these chapters, I go through the new instruments of competition. I go through the new instruments and potentials of conflict both local, regional and global conflict. And then finally, I look at the new instruments of cooperation uh, and the global goods that really the world needs to uh, cooperate on if we want uh, to survive, you know, climate change and technology uh, as examples. And then finally, I come, of course, as in every book, to the conclusion and the conclusion is going to make some suggestions of the direction in which the world is going to go and what a potential order will look like. My big argument here is that we now have come to a point where we've gone through, we are at the end of the post-Cold War era, it is over, and the disruption point was the 24th of February 2022 when Russia attacked Ukraine, and now we're looking basically at a decade of tension between the global west, the global east, and the global south. And we don't know exactly how it's going to end, but it is going to define the rest of uh, the century. Uh, still in this first lecture on uh, the book and on the new world order, uh, I want to say a couple of words about how I frame it in a preface. Um, you should know that every chapter starts and ends with an anecdote from the past. Because for me, you see, this book is not uh, really an academic book as such. It's somewhere between, you know, uh, the academic world and a biography and uh, a worldview. Uh, if you will. And of course, as you've noticed from my lectures, you know, I'm, I'm a prisoner of the West. I, I've been born and raised in, 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 uh, in Finland, up in the Nordics. I've studied in the US and in France and in Belgium and the UK. And I've worked most of my life in Europe. So obviously, my identity is very Western. But I also want to bring out sort of the personal perspective uh, in this book. So every 
chapter starts, you know, with, with a little story. I'll, I'll just give you an example from the preface. Starts like this. Autumn 2014. I remember it as if it was yesterday. Probably the darkest period in my political career. I've been prime minister for six months. Elections looming. The opinion polls are against me. Shit storms all over the place. My finance minister, chairman of our coalition partner, is playing games to no ends. His aim is to make me look bad, and I do. The Finnish media slams me around the clock. Things are not going my way. It feels like one of those end-of-career moments. I go to another European summit, my only escape from domestic politics. I sit next to Angela Merkel, legendary chancellor of Germany. I ask her what she does when things are not going her way. She gives me a reassuring look. Quote, you need to do two things, Alex. Don't read anything that's written about you in the media and go out on the campaign trail with your own. End of quote. I take her advice and start to recover. We do not win the 2015 elections, but do much better than expected. I negotiate my party into new government and become finance minister. In the summer of 2015, I look at my predecessor on the benches of opposition and cannot help feeling that in politics you get pretty much what you deserve. That's what democracy is all about. And a year later, I'm out of office too, after losing a leadership challenge in my party. Thankful for having served in government for 3,002 days. Time for others to take over. Uh, end of the preface. So I try to sort of begin every chapter with a story like this, and then I wrap up every chapter reflecting about, you know, the personal experience. But, you know, the, the, the sort of book itself and the writing style, as I said, is, is more personal, perhaps journalistic and easygoing than your, you know, heavy duty, academic uh, sourced book. So in many ways, the audience is not so much my academic colleagues or, you know, my political colleagues, but it's you. It's kind of everyone. I mean, you know, if the book ends up on the shelves of, of, of airport bookstores, you know, I'm, I'm super happy. Or if someone says that, yeah, you know, Alex has a knack of explaining what the world looks like and explaining it in a way in which I can understand, then that's great. And by the way, if it's simplified, it's because I have to understand it myself. So in the preface, uh, I talk about why being prime minister is both the best and the worst job uh, in the world. Um, I talk about some of the leaders that I've met over the years. I make a little bit of a distinction between Democrats and autocrats, because remember that in, in office, you end up meeting a whole bunch of people that you kind of fundamentally disagree with. I tell anecdotes, quite horrible anecdotes as well, uh, on occasion. Nothing, you know, super revealing or sensational, but, you know, when you meet someone like President Karimov of Uzbekistan, you know, you do have a couple of anecdotes to, to tell. Now, the book is also about the interdependence between theory and practice. So here you can see the identity thing. So I firmly believe that it's really good to frame whatever you're writing into some kind of a conceptual, a theoretical framework, a bigger picture that explains the world. At the same time, it's really good if you can kind of back it up with personal anecdotes and evidence and practice, because there is a big discrepancy between uh, theory uh, and practice. I also go back to the you know, classic that we human beings have a tendency to over-rationalize the past. In other words, think that things happen a certain way and explain it. We over-dramatize the present. We sort of get really het up about everything that's going on today or happened yesterday or tomorrow. And when we do these things, over-rationalize the past, over-dramatize the present, we underestimate the future. So I try to say in the preface that I'll try to avoid falling into these traps, but the truth is that, of course, in this book, I over-rationalize and simplify the past. And of course, I have to over-dramatize a little bit because, you know, every good story has to have a little bit 
uh, of, of extra action on it. But I will not underestimate the future. I'll try at least to look at the prism of the future. Uh, as I said, the thesis is very much global west versus global east and the world being decided by the global south, and I'll explain why. And the other th big theme in the book is also, you know, we have a choice. Are we going to compete? Are we going to go into conflict? Or are we going to cooperate? And of course, the world is such that we will do all three. There'll be some competition in economics, politics and technology. There'll be some conflict, local, even regional, hopefully not global. Uh, and we will need some cooperation. It's just a question of how we organize uh, uh, the cooperation. Um, I'll finish off uh, this first lecture by saying that the undercurrent of the book is essentially optimistic. It's part of my basic nature. It's the experiences that I've had in life. And it's a lot of the literature that I read. So my basic thesis is very much, if you don't know, what the world is going to look like tomorrow, presume that it's going to look better than yesterday. Because I do think that if you look at the big historical arch in global politics, the narrative with all the horrific tragedies around with deaths and wars and violence is still on the positive side. Mankind has a tendency to overcome adversity and then change and adapt to a new situation. So the working title of the book is The Global West versus the Global East or how the Global South is going to decide the next world disorder. I hope you will enjoy the series and let's begin with the introduction in the next lecture. Thank you very much for listening to the first part.